All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen McGee. I'm an assessment consultant here with Riverside, and I'm working uh, with Ohio schools and school districts along with my colleague, Bronwyn Kotorski. And I'll be the host for today's webinar. And thank you all for joining. With today's webinar and the discussion, it will be centering on all students and understanding their learning processes and fostering problem solving and reasoning abilities, and also enhancing their cognitive skills to promote uh, academic success and cultivate lifelong learners. We are also going to be talking about the impact of ability and achievement uh, our ability and achievement scores on student learning as well as the resources that we have that can assist with class grouping instruction and program placement but first, a little housekeeping, a little, a little housekeeping for us <laughs> During today's session, you may have some questions that you would like one of us to answer, and we certainly welcome those questions. So please type those into the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. It's going to look something like this image shown here on the left, and we will be sure to share your questions uh, as the topic arises on today's webinar. There are also a few handouts included with today's session, and those are included uh, under the handouts triangle in the right side panel. So be sure to download those today as well during the webinar. And also today's session is being recorded. You will receive the recording, a copy of the slides, the handouts, and a certificate of attendance in the next day or two. So be on the lookout for that email in your inbox. And recordings of other Riverside Insights webinars can be found on our website at info.riversideinsights.com backslash k12pd. So opening this page provides you with this header shown here. Thanks, Allison. Oh, we're very excited today that we have the great Rachel Dabney and the very lovely Erica Stone, both from Dublin City Schools here in Ohio. And I wanna introduce, let you guys introduce yourselves as you're a little bit more familiar with your own roles. <laughs> I am Rachel Dobney, coordinator of gifted services in my third year here in Dublin City Schools. And my name's Erica Stone. I am the English learner coordinator for the district, and this is my seventh year in this role. And before we move on, I do want to welcome all of uh, the attendees and the administrators throughout Ohio that are joining us today. We appreciate you guys being a part of this discussion. So, Rachel, I want to let you open the door to you and to Erica to explain a little bit more about your district. Just paint the picture of who Dublin City really is uh, or who you guys really are about or what about. Yep, we are. Um, just north of the city of Columbus, and we are a rapidly growing school district um, at approximately 17,000 students now um, and growing by a few hundred each year. Um, we have about 32% of our students have at least one gifted identification. Um, and then Erica, if you want to talk about EL. Yeah, and we have about a 12% um, EL identified population, but a much larger multilingual population across our diverse community. Good. Um, Sorry, did you want to add something else? Yeah, I was just going to also say we are the seventh largest EL program in the state, which is pretty significant for Ohio with the third yeah. largest population. So if you think about the dynamics of that, we receive more um, students that are new to the country than many of our larger counterparts. Um, so larger than many of the inner city uh, districts, which is what makes us unique. That is amazing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, because I think your journey and, and your story is just amazing what you guys do for all these students. But before we get to the now, um, I do want to talk a little bit more about the past and where you guys have been, because um, I think it can relate to a lot of people on this call. And Rachel, you 
started your role, you stated about three years ago at Dublin City Schools, and the assessment landscape was a little bit different than it is now. Will you share with us the assess what you were doing, the assessment plan that used to be in place, and then kind of the gaps you might have saw and how you started to approach that journey sure. to change things? Yep. We, um, we administer a variety of assessments um, to our students, including achievement and ability. Um, but as far as ability assessments, we were using different assessments to whole grade screen students. So we are required by the state of Ohio to screen students once in the K-2 band and once in the 3-6 band mm -hmm. um, and giving different assessments at grades two and four. Okay. And yeah. then what types of assessments do you administer to all your students? Sure. So we use um, MAP assessments for mm -hmm. students multiple times a year and um, we have switched to giving the COGAT um, consistent for consistency at grades two and four. And why did you choose those? Why did you choose MAP? What stood out with MAP? What stood out with COGAP for those decisions? So MAP, um, when I came here, it was the assessment we were giving. Um, and we find that useful to have um, those markers for our students multiple times a year. Um, and then with COGAT, um, just the ability to look deeper than a composite score and um, understanding subscores and how important they are for our, in, for our students was important um, as part of the whole, looking at the whole child um, from a data-driven perspective. Oh, I love that. And then how how is the data that you guys use from, or how is the data you get from ability assessments different from achievement measures with your, how do you use that with your district? Sure. So in thinking about um, the achievement assessment as a measure of what students have learned and then looking at the ability assessment as to how students reason with yeah. material that they've learned. And it gives us, um, we see oftentimes, um, I think that's probably why Erica and I are sitting here together today, um, discrepancies between achievement and ability. And we were noticing, looking at subscores for students on the COGAT, and the MAP assessment, when layering them over top of each other, we were seeing these discrepancies um, and how important it is to recognize the strengths in every student um, when so often um, we can look at data from a deficit mindset. Um, it's important to be able to layer the achievement and the ability data on top of each other to get a, a clear picture of a student's ability and achievement. Yeah, I would just add that from an outside perspective, I, I never understood ability testing. It, it was changing every year that we administered it. So for uh, someone in a, in a general role to understand what that data means and how, how it applies to my student population was very hard. And I think the consistency, the transparency that has been um, provided and improved over these past couple of years has made it really easy for us to have conversations around, you know, our, our subgroups of students. So it's amazing what you guys do. And I'm so excited to share more about it, but I want to turn it on over to Tina um, to talk a little bit more about what you just spoke about in a more general sense. Well, first of all, ladies, thank you for setting me up so beautifully for what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes and reiterating everything that I'm going to say. Um, so just so that we're all on the same page, um, Erica and Rachel just talked a little bit about the difference between ability and achievement. And as educators, we're so great at achievement, aren't we? We give our kids formative assessments, summative assessments. We know what they know, um, but we don't always look at ability. And so when we are talking about achievement, we're talking about what the student has learned. And when we're talking about ability, we're talking about how that student learns. And that's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's a good starting point to just talk about the difference between the two. So ability is really going to be influenced by all the learning opportunities that we have students, adults, everybody, both in and outside of the classroom, where achievement is directly in in, affected by the instruction that we're giving them. And when we look at 
uh, measuring ability, it really does look at problem solving and the reasoning process of your students. And that's gonna be really important for success in school. And it's also highly correlated with achievement because when students' abilities and strengths are tapped into, the achievement will follow. So again, uh, to reiterate what um, Erica and Rachel just said, when you plot that out on a graph like this, it's really easy to see not only where our students fall in clusters, but those outliers that we um, have in our classrooms. And honestly, I just was with a group of teachers the other day and they were looking at their COGAT data um, and they said, one of the teachers said, oh my goodness, I thought I had a class of high achievers. And I said, you do have a class of high achievers. They are achieving over where you expected them to be. But looking at their ability might open up some questions like, what are they doing to make sure they're achieving that high? What skills do they possess? Are there gonna be some pitfalls because maybe those high achievers who are of average ability are putting it all out there for you during math class or whatever it is, and they're gonna be tired later. So not only can we see where our kids cluster, but we can see those high um, achievement, average ability students. And then more often what we see with our gifted population is that we're gonna see that blue dot on the bottom, which is going to be our um, high ability, low achievement. We know that oftentimes some of those students in our classrooms who are the most gifted tend to underachieve because again, we're not looking at where their abilities lie and we tap into their abilities from a strengths-based perspective. Like I said earlier, the achievement follows. So as Tina just mentioned, using multiple measures provides that broad range of data to your students and the strength areas and opportunities to grow. So Rachel and Erica, since you're here, we're going to question you about this in your district about how is the data you get from, obviously we just talked about how you get the data or the data you get from the ability and uh, achievement assessments are different, but how useful is it for your educators within your district? Well, sure. We are currently um, undertaking a quite a large professional learning experience around COGAT data um, and moving beyond just the composite score to identify students with superior cognitive abilities. Um, but looking at um, this idea of the how aligned with the what. So um, yeah. like we were talking about that, on that on that graph there where where are we seeing outliers and where are we seeing large discrepancies between ability and achievement and and we see that with our el students um, oftentimes yeah mm. uh as there you go <laughs> Okay, so again, just to level set everybody, because some of you on this uh, webinar may not be familiar with the COGAT. When we're looking at the COGAT, we are looking at measuring three different batteries um, of problem solving skills. And they, underneath those batteries, you're gonna see three different sub tests. And so this is going to be measuring general and abstract inductive and deductive reasoning across all three areas. And I just wanna add that COGAT is the only ability assessment that is gonna offer unique testing levels per grade level. And we are also um, unique in the fact that not only do we offer a general score, verbal quantitative VQN all together, we also offer a score for the verbal battery, the quantitative battery and the nonverbal battery. And that really does give you the opportunity as an educator to look at where a student's strengths lie. Maybe somebody has a really high verbal strength, you can teach to that strength with that student. Maybe they're very high in nonverbal, but have a weakness in quantitative, you can use that to guide your instruction. So those are unique to COGAT, and you can see here we have three sub with different analogies that will tap into all of those types of reasoning for your students. So, what exactly does that mean when we're talking about what COGAT measures? 
Um, COGAT is designed primarily for use in schools, and it really emphasizes those general cognitive abilities and reasoning skills that are going to be super fundamental in achieving instructional objectives at each grade level. So it's, again, it's going to help you not with just your gifted kids, but all of your kids when you're guiding instruction. Um, as educators, we want to focus our curricula and our instructional methods to make sure we're challenging our students um, for all of our students, not just our gifted students. And we want to make sure that we're incorporating problem solving, critical thinking, higher levels of reading comprehension, and those other general cognitive um, skills that are really, really more central and more critical for the successful achievement of school objectives. So again, this is really going to help you position your students from uh, an area of strength. So oh, another way to simplify this and look at this is we are looking at how students reason with language, how do students reason with numbers, and how do students approach figural and abstract reasoning. So um, Rachel, I'm going to jump back to um, you and Erica for a minute and just ask you, you're administering this assessment, what aspects of the COGAT do you find most valuable for you in your roles? Um, sure. So not only do we um, have to identify students, so it's a it's a universal screener. So we can identify those students with a composite score for superior cognitive abilities, but we can also look at those subscores and see um, how important it is that every student has a strength. So um, thinking about professional learning that I was just um, I was just working with a building and um, thinking about historically, we had looked at um, students based based on that composite score and we're looking at them vertically and we're going, okay, here we're looking at the, the highest composite score in the grade level and then going down. And I challenged them to look horizontally and to look at each child and to recognize that each child has a relative strength and how can we build on that relative strength but also how can we shore up a challenge area? I yeah, I think I would just add that it should be no surprise that the highest uh, subscore for an EL student is that nonverbal component. And the rich discussions that follow as teachers are looking at that horizontally have been turning the tables in far as far as um, seeing the students differently, right? We're really pushing our teachers to look at this data when there's a student in question in the MTSS process. Um, so much of what we test in the United States is English. And so unless you know English, you're already at a disadvantage, um, achievement test or abilities, which is why we're, we're so excited about the Spanish version of the COGAT um, that we'll talk about, I'm sure, later on in this webinar. And you know what, ladies, I applaud you for taking that approach to using this data because actually, and I think we're, Bronwyn might talk about this in a little bit, but the COGAT was originally designed to look at all students. And as a former classroom teacher myself, I know that testing takes up a lot of instructional time, right? And if you're universally screening an entire grade level, why wouldn't you use that data for all of the students? And I love yeah. how you brought up that for your ELs, this is a great way for you to see their strengths because so often we are over identifying our EL students into special education programs when actually it's just a language barrier. And once they learn the language, it's much, much easier. And um, on the next slide, you're all going to get a chance to see what those different um, batteries look like um, in the COGAT assessment. Um, Allison, do you want to? There you go. And you can see from here that COGAT is um, very picture based. There is a very, very low language load. At the lower grades, there are there's no language load, K12. But at the upper grades, the language load is very minimal. And I'm just going to add too that COGAT is not testing your ability to read. So if you have an EL student or a special ed student that needs the test read to them, that is a perfectly acceptable accommodation. Um, you can see here that um, in the verbal section, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Um, these actually are, again, picture-based, and those were developed bilingually in English and Spanish. And I'd like to also add that we do have directions in eight different languages um, and languages that are very unique, like Somali and two different kinds of um, Chinese and Vietnamese and languages that you don't always see highlighted in um, general testing. So um, the um, center one, the quantitative, going to be the types of um, items that in this one it's primary students that they're going to see in that and um, like the items in the verbal battery the quantitative items are picture based and they're similar in format to the verbal items but they actually assess inductive and deductive reasoning using quantitative concepts such as whole or half and series progression and then if you look at that last one that nonverbal or figural um, those items are going to require students to reason and understand using figures such as which ones go together, how they're similar, alike, and dissimilar, how folded and manipulated paper will look once it's unfolded. And um, it's a really great, again, way of non-verbally assessing those uh, reasoning strengths and weaknesses within our students. All right, we just want to take a quick pause to see if there's any questions or if anybody that is attending wants to ask Rachel or Erica any questions about what we've discussed so far. Allison, are we good? Um, yes, but there was a question about the collaboration because as you just mentioned about um, the MTSS process and collaboration across departments and how you use the data, um, thinking PLCs. So, can you elaborate a little bit on that collaboration that goes on? Sure. Um, it's actually, you know, in my only in my third year here, um, we are thinking about how we can collaborate in multiple spaces. So, um, you know, fortunately, Erica and I have known each other for a long time before we um, even started working here in Dublin. Um, so it was a natural fit for us to, for me to say, hey, um, I, I need to find somebody who's uh, willing to hear me out about this data and how useful it is. So um, like I said, Erica was a, a natural go-to for me to be able to say, hey, look, let's talk about this data and how it impacts your students, um, your specific population of students. Um, and then actually this afternoon, I'll be working with our reading support team to say, how can COGAD data be used when we're having conversations about which students qualify for reading support? Um, and it's just, it's, it seems like um, potentially there's a long road ahead of us, but the more people know, the better we do. And so this is just new for us. And, um, you know, I'm kind of in a space where anybody who will hear me out about the data, I'm going to go into that space and have a conversation about it. So, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about our specific subgroups of students and um, how this piece of data can add a different lens to a potential conversation um, about being referred for special education services. Yeah, and I'll just add in EL, the way that I've been able to lift this work is through um, is through the ELL critical data process. It's um, something we've been implementing in our district for about four or five years, and it's embedded in our MTSS framework. So um, there are 16 items that you analyze when an EL student goes through the MTSS or the ELL critical data process. Um, because we know that assessments put ELs at a disadvantage, uh, we're trying to look at the bigger picture. And in one of the items, it tells you to look at data that may not be achievement-based, may show you abilities outside of achievement results. And so we've really been using COGAT results as a way to um, ground those conversations in that item to really see students from a, a bigger picture. Um, and, and that's helped move the needle, uh, honestly, and, and getting people to see students in a different light. Um, so that looks different at every building, but it, it's through however they build and map out their MTSS process. Perfect. All right, so a best practice of universal testing is using the scores and the data that we 
are provided to really improve our instruction. All students who take COGAT complete get this ability profile that you see in front of you. Um, and basically you're going to receive an ability profile score, which is unique to our assessment. So this score is really another data point that can really help you get to know your students um, and it's really useful for differentiating instruction for all students, not just those identified as gifted. Uh, this score really helps you curate your, your watch list, so to speak, or students that don't quite fit perfectly into that gifted box, but really they could benefit from you know, some additional challenge. So the ability profile captures two characteristics of how a student performed on COGAT. So the first characteristic, is the level or the median age stay nine score. The median age stay nine is telling you how strong your students' cognitive reason, uh, reasoning abilities are. So nine being that they're really very high, four to six being that they're relatively average, and then one to two being on the lower end. And the median stay nine, or median age stay nine, I should say, indicates the student's level of ability to reason really. The table shown here is providing meaning to those scores. And you're gonna see that letter as well next to the five. And that is the pattern of the student's responses and scores on each of the three batteries. So the pattern is identified on the student's report really as a confidence band, those shaded rectangles. Uh, so in any case, um, you're going to see this around the age percentile rank score for each of the three batteries. And the pattern, what that's indicating is that's telling you whether scores within a battery are significantly higher or lower than scores within either or both of the other batteries. So the score above also shows that Q minus that you see there, meaning that the students got a relative strength or, or I'm sorry, a relative area of opportunity in the quantitative battery. So that, that reasoning with numbers. And then you'll see an N plus as well. And that's really telling us the student has a relative strength in the nonverbal battery. So we just talked about what COGAT measures and how it can be used to help inform instruction, not only for gifted students, but it can help more equitably inform all areas of instruction as well from a strengths-based perspective. So Rachel, can you tell me a little bit about what ways you use the data from COGAT and how does it support your long-term goals in Dublin City Schools? Sure. Um, so in thinking about, we actually just implemented a new strategic plan and um, it's this we call the Journey 2030. And um, one of the key components in the strategic plan is about equity and access. Um, so thinking about how can this piece of data help us increase access for students to authentic enrichment opportunities outside of a traditional gifted service. So where a student might score um, in the range to be considered su of superior cognitive abilities, we know students have strengths within that. Um, and so being able to say in the name of equity and access, um, how can we support students based on their strengths? Right. Are there specific reports that are beneficial to you when in using the data? And, and can you tell me about those and why? Sure. Um, so currently we are diving into subscore data. Um, and so in thinking about um, the reports and actually Bronwyn, the, um, the ability profile of the child, um, I love that. Um, but in thinking about where, where my team is currently, um, I would love to get to the point where we could share the ability profile with families so that they have a better understanding of what this data is telling us about their student. Um, but we have to have a better understanding, I feel, of the verbal, the quantitative, and the nonverbal subscores and what those scores mean for our kids before we can present an ability profile that provides them with a day nine and like a Q plus and an N minus. Um, we need to be able to internally speak to what each of those subscores mean. And, um, you know, going from previously and historically only ever providing a composite score for families. Last year, for the first time, we provided subscores 
for families. And it really um, enhanced the conversations around what does this piece of data um, mean for my child as far as instructions concerned. That's great. Very impressive. And, and just to kind of go over some of the, you know, information specific to Ohio, um, we know that superior cognitive ability, um, Ohio says districts shall identify students as gifted in the area of su superior cognitive ability when a student accomplishes any of the following. So basically scores two standard deviations above the mean minus the standard error of measurement. Um, we're also looking at uh, they also, well, that would be on an approved intelligence test or ability assessment, mm -hmm. uh, performs at or above the 95th percentile on an approved composite battery of a nationally normed achievement test. And I know you mentioned MAP before, um, or attains an approved score on an approved nationally normed above grade level achievement test. So, yep. Yep. Um, and another thing to mention when thinking about how are we using this data, we mm -hmm. also have an accelerated math pathway um, that was um, historically students were placed into that math service based mm -hmm. on what felt like an achievement heavy rubric mm -hmm. um, that led kids to receive a certain score and we all know how rubrics work. Um, but what I thought was missing was the students with high ability. So mm -hmm. last year we um, decided to incorporate a high quantitative score um, as um, a measure for placement into this service. And in thinking about what our data looked like over the last decade, we had years um, where there were no students receiving EL services placed into our accelerated course because they weren't achieving mm -hmm. and they weren't I don't know did we lose Rachel um I'm not sure oh. they're frozen oh. on my screen okay well, and it is a windy day, so I think a lot of folks might be experiencing all kinds of technical issues today. <laughs> That's so, the um, she oh, was. there we go. Right, Rachel, are you there? No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, but Rachel, I don't know where I cut off. That? Yeah. Okay. You might, um, for bandwidth yeah, yes. issues, you might want to go off camera and just speak because um, I know you guys are in the middle of a storm, so it might help. Um, so, Brown, and I know that they're wrapping okay. up their point, Hopefully but Rachel, uh, you were very helpful. So, sorry if we wanted to jump um, to the next one. Sure. Continue the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the differentiated instruction report that you're seeing. Um, this is a report that teachers can access and it already groups your students according to their ability profile. Now, I just wanna point out, this is something teachers see, but when administrators log in, they wouldn't be able to necessarily access the differentiated instruction report. So what this is doing is it's grouping your students by their learning styles, and it's offering suggestions for building on strengths, scaffolding, um, other instructional recommendations. And I want you to notice the instructional strategies that are displayed on this slide. So this is incredibly helpful um, for all your students, not just for gifted and talented. Okay, and this is an example of our new actionable ability profile that you can find at cogat.com for every possible ability profile score. So the cogat ability profile, it's also providing the teacher and students ways to use their cognitive strengths so that they can be successful in school. A child with poor mathematical reasoning might leverage their verbal reasoning abilities when they're improving on their mathematical reasoning abilities. And again, we have ideas for appropriate language to spark growth and interest with each student, and that's also available. Thanks, Bradwin. 
So Rachel and Erica, I hope you are still there. <laughs> We're here. Okay, great. Uh, it's weird not being able to see you. So, <laughs> as, so these are some questions. I just want to dive into Erica and you and, and the and the EL programs that you have in place. Um, so I'd love to open the conversation. And as Erica, as the English language coordinator for Dublin Schools, can you tell us a little bit about the EL population um, within your district and how, and you started at the beginning, but I just like to hear kind of the overview of, you said briefly a little bit of detail, but I'd love to hear about it some more. Yeah, so we're currently at a little over 2,000 EL students in our district, and over 50% of them are immigrants. That means that they're coming here with very high levels of need for support in language acquisition, right? Most of them are brand new to learning English. Um, and so I think that's interesting in that we, we are constantly revisiting um, ways that we can serve those students in all spaces. I'll give you an example. We have a high population of Asian students coming from Korea, Japan, China, and it's been really fascinating in the past couple of years that they are they are testing out of EL services. So they're not even qualifying because in a test, they have high enough levels of English, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the classroom and their abilities to participate and articulate um, what they know about the language. Mm -hmm. The same students are testing off the charts in achievement or co COGAT mm -hmm. in the area of, of quantitative quanti yeah. yeah and nonverbal really and so um we've been having a lot of great dialogue around how you you serve a student like that what's the appropriate placement how can we reach them knowing that they have those abilities right? But language might still prove to be a barrier in some aspects of it. Um, so that's an example of what makes us very unique in Dublin, right? I, yeah, it's amazing what you guys do. And then um, you, you started tapping on this, but I, I would love to dig a little bit deeper in that you said like EL students may be misidentified or placed into special education due to the language barrier. But how, when you use achievement and ability data together to support your decisions for program placement, or how does it uh, direct your decision so, for program placement, I should say? The author of the EL critical data process is Steve Gill. He is a practicing psychologist out of the state of Washington who has an extensive background in TESOL. Um, and his recommendation is that you make decisions on eligibility, uh, you put about 15% of your decision-making around assessment of re results mm -hmm. <laughs> for English learners, right? Yep. Um, our Spanish speakers are our highest population of English learners across the nation. That's also true in Dublin. And you would think, right, that they they acquire English quicker than their peers because Spanish and English has have a lot of similarities, but yeah. that's not true. They happen to be our most at risk population for being over identified in special education, and they are the highest number of students that um, what we call long term English learners (LTELs). <laughs> they are the population where it takes us the longest to to work through the acquiring of English. So um, why that is, our Spanish speakers don't have access to, to learning their native language formal, formally in schools. And English learners build a lot of transference skills if they're educated in their first language. That's why our Japanese, Korean, and Chinese population do so well. They have so many skills in their native language that they transfer in learning English. So um, this, this process helps us to uncover some of those truths about why a student might be taking 
longer to acquire the language or why their achievement data may be progressing at a slower rate than peers. Um, it's really intended to dig in deep, look at all the data and see the, the bigger picture about a child, their journey, and um, level the playing field for them when we're making those decisions. I love that. So to kind of expand on that, other departments then are using COGAT, correct? And and where are you using that COGAT data within other departments? The results, I mean, we're we're looking at them. And I would say this is improving every year. As mm -hmm. as we mentioned before, you know, Rachel's been here for three years, but prior to this, it was different data every year at different grade levels. So now that it's consistent, we can we can ask the MTSS teams to yeah. make sure they review that data in this process. And then Rachel continues to to visit buildings and do PD yeah. at a building level. Yeah. I'm spending lots of time with classroom teachers. Um, and like I shared with Erica's team, um, we continue to talk about how can this data and again not just that composite score that we've historically only looked at but how can mm -hmm. these sub scores help us help our students um, and that goes um, from high levels of trying to at the highest level trying to figure out like as coordinators what what do we do with this data and how do we make the best decisions for students all the way down to the granular level like in the classroom how can a gifted intervention specialist support students with a high nonverbal score in a space? How can we better understand students with a high verbal score? And how can that help us then help them in a math space? You know, so if like that, if the language is high, if that, um, if the verbal is their highest sub score and their quantitative is their lowest sub score, how can we? utilize their strength in the verbal space to help shore up and help them reason with mathematics. Yeah. So I love I love I love the passion that you guys have when you talk. It's so intoxicating. It's just like it's just a great <laughs> mission that you guys are on. And um, I know we're kind of creeping up on the time, so I want to just ask one more question about uh, something great that you just shared with me about opening the door this year to administering COGAT um, in Spanish, you know, fully in Spanish, and that's going to happen in March. So can you share a little bit more about this decision on, on what's happening and the thought process behind that? Sure. Um, so thinking about um, really getting a true picture of our students. Um, the second highest language spoken in Dublin City Schools behind English is Spanish. Um, so it made sense for us after, um, you know, I think my first year here, I was just learning and then asked, um, asked some questions and was asked some tough questions last year about test administration and what that means for us and for our students. And um, knowing here this year that we can administer the assessment in Spanish, um, we sat down last week and made a decision to um, offer COGAT in both English and Spanish for our students. Um, and I want Erica to talk about the how they determined that because what uh, um, what I thought was, oh, students receiving EL services in Spanish or language services in Spanish, that's just our target our target space. And I've learned so much from Erica's team about um, who really should be um, receiving administration in Spanish. Yeah, our initial concern was just that there would be some literacy components um, in Spanish. As I mentioned a little bit ago, not all of our Spanish speakers um, can read or write in Spanish. So the fact that it's all audio um, really makes it accessible to all of our Spanish speakers. And that is so exciting for us. Um, we administer at second and fourth grade and, and you know we've built out rosters of all of our Spanish speakers that have a native or home language of Spanish. And we're having building teams review to say whether or not that would be an appropriate version to provide them. Um, based on 
the 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 guidance that we've given them, which is 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 just functionality of the assessment. Um, I think the other thing that makes me very excited, at least for our Spanish population, is you know we have students coming in the doors nonstop right now, so they could arrive next week and take an assessment that's accessible to them, and that doesn't happen very often. So. Um, yeah, it was a no-brainer for us, and and we were able to accomplish <laughs> the logistics of it in a day, and it's starting next week. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think once we decide, I mean, your Eric has right that there wasn't ever any. I don't think there was any hesitation in knowing that this was the right move for our kids. It's just new, um, so there's going to be a lot of questions, and so I think um, really us sitting down in what felt like was going to be a potentially tough meeting really was like just full of joy yeah. really like we all just kind of sat down and all of a sudden everybody's like smiling like oh my gosh we're really doing this for our kids and knowing that that another population of our students are going going to potentially get to shine um in this space was was really like a great way to start that day and end last week mm -hmm. um, saying we know that this is what's best for kids and this is what we're doing. Yeah, I've never been so excited to look at data. Like it can't get <laughs> soon enough for me. <laughs> we're gonna record, you guys need to record when you like start pulling the data out and just be like the oh, pure it's, joy it's across the room. This. Yeah. I feel like it's almost welcoming to the students, almost like, like you're welcoming them with an assessment that fits them do you feel mm -hmm. that way when you kind of when you administer it well we haven't done it yet but yes yeah. i i am predicting that we will feel that way okay. um because it is i mean an english learner is the most tested subgroup in in schools in within a 30-day window outside of this they have to take an el identification screener map assessments yeah. um and it falls in March during this window, COGAT, you know? And so to be able to sit down and, and and hear a language that's familiar to you, there's nothing more rewarding um, to a child than that. Yeah, uh, I'm so excited for you guys. <laughs> yeah, so you've got, what is it? One down, how many languages do we have in our district? <laughs> We're at 84. You've got yeah. 80, 82. No, no tall task there, but we'll take what you have. Okay, great. <laughs> we'll get working. <laughs> so you all, once again, just made my job really easy. And can I just say, where were you when I was a young teacher? My goodness, I, the population that I spent over 20 years working with is exactly like what you're describing in uh, Dublin City Schools. and. I had so much achievement data on my students and I had zero ability and I knew, I knew that my students had gifts and I would sit in those PLCs looking at all this achievement data and I, I know that I could have done better. So I'm so, it, it warms my heart to hear what you're saying because if I would have had that, it, it would have been amazing for me. So anyway, I'm just gonna jump over these next few slides because these ladies already did a beautiful job talking about how we can use the ability assessment data to help differentiate. They said all of this, so we can just go on to the next one. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, with COGAD, it, it was not developed originally as a gifted assessment. It was really developed to identify the strengths in all of our students. And again, how you ladies mentioned that you're taking a horizontal look and you're not just taking off that top um, tiered group of students, that is exactly the way it should be used. And I'm gonna quote our, uh, our COGAT guru at our company, as long as you're assessing all of those students universally, why do you put those scores in the drawers and not use that data? Take the scores out of the drawers and use it for the good of all of your students across all level. And then just really practically, I know that we have thrown a lot of information at you, so um, we're just gonna show you a couple quick examples of how you could use that data to differentiate within your classroom. And if you visit colgat.com, we have uh, templates to help you do this. So when your students know where their relative strengths and weaknesses lie, 
you can give them voice and choice for certain activities. We know sometimes you just have to give a test or sometimes they just have to write an essay. That's just the way it is. But in those opportunities where they can utilize their strengths to present the information the way that it works for them, give them voice and choice, something like this, where you give them options and suggestions to present the needed information the way that it works for them. Also, when looking at grouping, um, if you go to the next slide, the, uh, the way to do that can vary. Um, you can use the stay nine scores to put students together um, that are similar, but you can see here, like we have all the twos and ones together. We have all the um, sevens together, but their areas of strength and weakness, like their Q, their V and N are different. So they all have a similar stay nine score, but their areas of strengths and weaknesses vary. So you still have diversity within those groups. All right, so we're wrapping up. And so I just wanna talk, we've talked about the past, we've talked about the present and the great things you guys are doing, but I wanna ask you guys, since you're really working on your roadmap with Dublin, um, Rachel, I just wanna ask, you, you currently do grade two and four, and then you mentioned, or you have mentioned the value of a higher grade level. Um, do you, what value do you see in those higher grade bands that sometimes might not get that type of attention? Sure, um, I think about like when we don't have it, it now looking at, it will be able to say uh, the profile of a student over time using COGAT um, should be able to provide us with a fairly clear picture of their strengths or that they're all over the place and how do we work with a student like that if we've administered the same assessment over time, right? Um, but it's come up then in my team about who work at middle school, like how, how long is this data valid and um, is there value in um, potentially capturing ability data for our students um, in, in the middle school and what might that mean in thinking about, um, you know, we have uh, documents that talk about our 612 pathways and how could current ability data help us help our students when they think about those options and opportunities that lie ahead for them in middle and high school. You know, we've got every opportunity under the sun for our high school kids but then their ability data goes back to fourth grade. Um, yeah. So thinking about, you know, being intentional about not over assessing students, but what might be the value in, in adding another round of assessment. So um, a conversation that my secondary team and I um, are having and something for us to definitely be thinking about. Yeah, it's always a great, some people, I mean, what you do is great. So taking it up into another grade band sounds beneficial but we um one last thing because you you seem like you're on this great mission and or this great roadmap and so what's ahead for Dublin for supporting your students with achievement and ability data like this year next year you said you have a pathway the the 2030 pathway or something so what do you see you know coming towards you for your students I just see this conversation happening in more spaces. Um, I think it's been, like I said, you know, it was a very natural opportunity for me to say, hey, Erica, can I have this conversation with your team? Um, but thinking about um, my own team and their understanding even of this data, and we just continue to learn more about it and to feel more confident in our own understanding and where that takes us. So the professional learning um, we've we've done has been in two elementaries this year and we have 14 and a 15th one opening in the next what is not next year but two years yeah two yeah years. two years um, so there's so much work to be done in deepening our own understanding of this data and my team's really doing a fantastic job of bringing it to the table COGAT data outside mm -hmm. of a composite score. And when you think about the education of an entire community of people, that does include um, 
our stakeholder parents as stakeholders in their mm -hmm. children's education. And so what does it mean to um, educate a community of, of 17,000 people and growing? Um, so we're making big strides, um, but also small steps at the same time. So mm -hmm. I, I would add, I think what Rachel and I will need to figure out and continue looking into um, is how to provide those services, right? When we know these students have abilities and yet there is the language barrier, what then do the services look like? How do we tap into that and, and support the students and meet them where they are? Um, so that will be fun learning together. Yes. <laughs> It's a lot of learning. It's like every, as long as we're not going backwards, I feel like it's just a, it's a great journey for you guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, it really, it really has been. And, and we've got, we've got a road ahead of us, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't foresee huge obstacles in the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. I'm going to pass it over to Bronwyn as we're wrapping up. All right. Well, Tina mentioned this a little bit earlier in our, our presentation today, uh, but you're looking right now at a screenshot for the new and improved COGAT.com. Uh, this is the website you can go to that houses all kinds of resources, instructional tools. You're going to find sample lesson plans, interactive dashboards so you can add, analyze your data, gifted identification guides for new district leaders, you're also going to find really helpful information for parents because it's so helpful to be able to go there and have an explanation of how to talk to parents. And even better, when you go to parent resources, there are all kinds of questions there where parents can work with their own students. All right, and of course at Riverside Insights, we offer a comprehensive selection of measurement tools because what we're trying to do is help educators effectively assess every student. Uh, what we're trying to do is provide resources to help translate those measurements into meaningful information that can be used across the student population. So our products include insights into K-12 students' achievement, ability, and social-emotional needs, as you see from the range here. We're also very proud to say that Riverside Insights was just awarded the Excellence in Equity Award for accessibility in the industry by the American Consortium for Equity in Education. I always stumble over that phrase. <laughs> Equity and Access recognizes companies, leaders, authors, educators, whose efforts are really trying to help schools achieve equity everywhere. We offer a comprehensive selection of measurement tools designed to help educators effectively assess every student. And we provide resources to help translate those measurements into meaningful information that can be used across your student population. So in addition to the Iowa assessments, Iowa Flex and COGAT um, that we were looking at today, we are also offering, as we mentioned before, social emotional solutions, solutions to support your students' mental and emotional health. Um, we have an algebra readiness assessment to help you figure out if your student's skill level uh, is going to put them on track to take algebra one. Um, a benchmarking and progress monitoring solution, great for your RTI tier two and three students. And reading assessments that measure skills from early childhood all the way to adulthood. So let's take a look at the chat. Um, Allison, so far, do you have any more questions that we can answer? Um, the, the one is about the accelerated math pathway. I think um, that's where we uh, <laughs> um, didn't finish the conversation. If you can just share a little bit more about that. Sure, and I'm probably gonna freeze up too because I just turned my camera back on. Um, but it, we have um, in an achievement heavy rubric Previously, um, we were missing students and had multiple years where zero students receiving EL services would have qualified for an accelerated math placement. Um, and you would then look at their subscores and their quantitative subscore, like one student in particular, um, barely hit double digits in our rubric points, but had a quantitative subscore of 140 and would have historically not been placed into that service. So the addition now of adding um, 
the ability and the quantitative subscore um, has been tremendous in increasing access. Yeah, I think we grew by eight times last year in what we served by by changing the rubric up. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and this sharing. wasn't a complete overhaul. Like we still want to value um, high achievers in that space, but it's just now the looking at it just a little bit differently. Is there? A, are we missing kids in? Um, is there a group of students who are who are absent from this and is there a way for them to have access and that's why we went to that quantitative subscore that would like to me that was a no-brainer let's go look at their quantitative subscore and see if we can can pull more students who do need to be placed into this space yeah love that that you use those subscores um that's really adding adding value to, for those kids as well um, so they get placed in these programs. Mm -hmm. And that's all that I see in the chat for today. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, we want to say thank you for joining us today, Rachel and Erica. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Your journey and what you're doing with Dublin is just amazing. And we want to say thank you to all the attendees for joining this great conversation. Um, if there's any questions, um, post webinar please feel free to reach out to Bronwyn or I and then uh we're you know just out of time we're over time actually but please join us for the webinars uh in the future and then be on a lookout for your in your inbox for those invites for the future and then uh until next time guys we thank you so much and if there's no other questions we'll let you all get back to work or into the windstorm that's happening Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Thanks for having me. We appreciate you. Yeah, we do. Thank you. All right, and thanks to everybody who joined us today.